Hello, you're very welcome to the Hugh Lane Gallery series of online talks. My name is Sarah and today we're looking at a beautiful painting by the Irish artist William John Leach and the painting is called The Water Monaco. So this is painted in 1913. It's an oil on canvas and it's 61 by 50 centimetres and it was presented to the gallery and to the gallery collection by the artist himself. It was painted when he was 32 years old. He was born in 1881. And it's part of an extensive collection of works um, that form the Hugh Lane Gallery collection. Now, as you see, this is an atmospheric and decorative landscape and um, seascape. And it shows a view of water seen through the branches of a tree, almost as if the trees and the strong diagonal line of the promenade in the foreground frame are a view. The water and its surroundings are all observed from a considerable height. Now, Monaco, the location, is of course a sovereign city-state um, along the coast of the south of France, near the coast of Italy, near the border with Italy rather. Now it's very populated, very densely populated now, and built up, but in 1913 it would have been a much simpler, a smaller port. Now before we take a look at the painting, uh, I'd like to have um, talk about his leech himself uh, and how he had got to this point in his career, um, as well as looking at some compar comparable works. So this here is a lovely portrait that's in the Ulster Museum, self-portrait. He painted many portraits. He wasn't just a landscape artist, um, including many self-portraits. So this is um, clearly an older man very carefully dressed, I like that, the little hanky in his pocket, and the hat, the details of his glasses. And notice how the dark colours are set beautifully against that, brack, that, that, that bright uh, background with the lovely foliage. As I said, he was born in 1881 in Dublin and he lived for a time in number 47 Parnell Square which is coincidentally just beside Charlemont House, where the Hugh Lane Gallery is located. Um, he spent most of his career abroad, but nevertheless considered himself to be an Irish painter. He was the son of a law professor in Trinity College, Dublin. The family were well off and he went uh, to school for some time in, in St. Columbus in Rathfarnham, and then on for a, a couple of years to Switzerland as well. After school, he enrolled at the Dublin Metropolitan School of Art. He didn't stay very long, however, because he um, was dissatisfied with the teaching, apparently, and he wanted to go to the RHA schools, the Royal Hibernian Academy schools, where the teacher was Walter Osborne. Um, and he was, a, he was a tutor that he admired. Even at, at that very young age, uh, Leach's talents were admired and recognized and he won the Taylor Prize which is a prize for up-and-coming artists uh, he won it four times in total over, over those years. Now by 1901 he was following in the footsteps of so many British and Irish painters of the time he moved to Paris and he enrolled at the Academy Julien that prestigious school um, and even at a very still a young age the age of 19 and 20 he was uh, producing a lot of paintings and sending them back uh, to be shown at the RHA annual exhibition. Now, by 1903, um, he, like again, like so many uh, of his fellow artists, British fellow artists, he moved to Brittany, to the artist colonies on the, along the western seaboard of, of France. Um, in fact, he just arrived, he arrived just about exactly the same time as uh, the Irish artist Roderick O'Connor was leaving. So for him, he settled, uh, the place he chose to settle was the seaport of Concarno. Um, and he visited there many times over the next 10 to 15 years. Many harbour scenes, painted landscapes, etc. And we're going to look at one of them now. This is in the National Gallery of Ireland's collection. And it's called A Still Afternoon in Concarneau. And it was painted in 1910. Um, I think that this painting and another that we look at afterwards uh, 
a really invite direct comparison with uh, the water Monaco, which of course was painted three years after this. So just like the water Monaco, uh, the artist is um, really focusing on the patterns of light uh, or how light is reflected on water. Again, we see the tree trunks rising in the foreground and um, how they frame our view. And they also suggest the position of the artist. So by interrupting our view in this way, the artist is perhaps implying that he made the painting or at least did the preparatory work in situ rather than it being a scene that he imagined or, or contrived. And in this, he was very much following in the impressionist tradition that is sketching out of doors, working quickly to capture the effect of light, um, sunlight on water particularly, shadow, and all from um, a direct observation of nature. Now 1910, the year that this was painted, was an important year for Leach. He was elected by his contemporaries to the Royal Hibernian Academy, so he became a full academician and from that point on uh, had the letters RHJ after his name. This was a great year, um, I suppose it was a great year, but it was also a great honour rather. And then um, in terms of his personal life, his family moved permanently from Dublin to London at around this time. And his stays in Ireland became much more spor sporadic. Um, another painting I wanted to um, show you was this painting called Lake Geneva Winter. Um, this is in private ownership. It was auctioned by Adams Auctioneers in 2012. And so this is painted a year after the previous painting and two years before the Water Monaco. Um, so we know that Leach was already familiar with Switzerland. He'd spent uh, time there uh, as a young man, very useful for the time he was to study in Paris and uh, all those years backwards and forwards uh, working and living in France. We know that he visited Switzerland in, uh, and Venice, in fact, in 1910, and he produced um, quite a few works around that time, and all of them demonstrate the influence uh, of the artist James McNeil Whistler on his work. Now, Whistler was an Anglo-American artist uh, who was working um, in London primarily um, from the middle to the late 19th century. And he had a very distinctive style, a kind of unique style, if you like, and it was often considered that style, that Whistlerian style, a kind of forerunner to post-impressionism. He painted, uh, this is Whistler, simplified atmospheric landscapes in, in subtle and kind of neutral tones and, and looked to create a sort of mi misty atmosphere in his paintings. And, um, and we can see here with this painting by, by Leach, we can see how he's taken on board that kind of pared down approach um, and how that pared down approach is really emphasized by um, Leach's characteristic uh, diagonals. So we see a diagonal running across the foreground. In this case, it's a wide bank of snow. And that this kind of foreground diagonal is kind of presenting to us the view beyond, if you like. Um, and that view, again, is framed by those two vertical trees. In this case, that sprinkling of um, those rusty colored uh, autumn winter leaves. And it was around this time, 1910-1911, that Leach's style began to change and he began to move towards a purer and more vibrant use of, of colour in his practice. He had become increasingly aware of the experiments being made by post-impressionist artists, artists such as uh, Henri Matisse and Pierre Bonnard, who were the great experimenters and they experimented with was really using strong colors and highly unusual uh, perspectives and compositions. So this painting, back to the original painting that we're looking at, The Water in Monaco, painted two years later after the painting in Geneva, um, is very interesting because it manages to me to combine uh, those muted tones and that f those flat washes of colour that he'd used in his previous work with 
the brighter tones and that looser application of paint. You can see it in the water, how he paints the water. Um, uh, that, that looser application, those bright colours of the Impressionist and post-Impressionist artists. So this painting has two quite different styles. Now let's first consider the influence of Whistler on, on Leach and also, well, Whistler and um, the trend of the time for Japonisme. Now, Whistler, like so many artists, not just Whistler, but so many artists of the time were influenced by Asian art. And it was known, this craze was known as Japonisme. Um, and they're particularly interested, not just uh, in textiles and China in ceramics, but also, and very particularly in, China, in Japanese prints. Claude Monet was another collector of, of these woodblock prints. Hugely popular in, in the 19th century, later 19th century. And they, as I said, had that very unusual aesthetic uh, that appealed. So they were, they were about strong outline. They were about unusual perspective, often aerial perspective. Um, and they had, an, the emphasis of the painting was less on accurate representation, but an overall um, decorative effect. These prints had arrived in Europe in the 1850s um, and then onwards for decades afterwards. But around that time, um, trade routes had opened between Europe and America and uh, Japan. They were mass produced prints known as ukiyo-e prints, woodblock as I said, and they really created, the influence of them was so profound that they created a link between um, Eastern and Western art traditions. Originally painted in black and white, produced or printed rather in black and white and later printed in color. And here's an example of one. Well, when I, as you can imagine, uh, when I came across this print, I had to include it because of the multiple references and similarities. So this is by the well-known Japanese artist Hiroshi, and it's part of a series of prints called 100 Famous Views of Edo. Edo. Um, it's dated, although I haven't put it there, I'm sorry, it's, not, it's dated 1857. So uh, I think you can see how um, this, uh, this, would have, this kind of image, if perhaps Leach had seen it or something similar to it. Now, the woodblock, the Japanese woodblock art was not meant to portray real life, but rather the artist's viewpoint. Um, these prints were usually flat in appearance. I and mean, when I say flat, I mean that they lacked uh, our Western art's traditional depth of perspective. Um, now many artists, European artists, studied Japanese woodblock print, as I said, and they really began to experiment with, uh, with these new ideas of perspectives. Um, bright patterns, contrasting colours, and very importantly, those flat planes that were similar um, to, to, the, to how work was produced with printing. And that flattened effect, um, not just the, the, the planes of colour, but perspective, was to become a predominant feature in the development of modern art. Now let's go back to Leach. Um, so we can see how he took on board the trends of Japonisme and his careful, Leach's careful decorative arrangements generally tend to have strong vertical or diagonal emphasis. And again, and, and as we see that flattened perspective, it's almost like a rising perspective rather than a depth into the painting. And these paired back um, simplified scenes. Um, and that simplification, that, that, that simplification of, of, of the particulars in the painting really emphasised the decorative effect. And in this case, very particularly the decorative effect of the silhouetted trees and the sparse uh, leaves on the trees. We're looking down from quite a height. Our view is framed on three sides, not just the rising verticals of the trees as we've seen, but also that strong uh, diagonal line running across the foreground of the canvas, just as we saw with Lake Geneva in winter. You remember that bank of snow. Um, we know from the title, The Water Monica, that we're looking down on the waterfront and across the bay to a stretch 
of Monaco seafront, a harbor. Now the trees to me are interesting, such slim silhouettes, so very dark, perhaps a contrast to the very bright light of the water and its reflections, definitely a trick of the eye in the light. The scant foliage could represent one of the many tropical trees that grow in Monaco. I went off on a tangent looking at those at one point. Um, and certainly those trees are, are the strongest, um, if you like, Japanese element in the picture, as we've seen with that print from Hiroshi, that the view seen through dark branches of trees and the extent to which it in various guises and various approaches was a kind of a signature aesthetic. Now in the foreground, we can just make out a number of people walking on the pier and it takes a bit of squinting, they're kind of loosely suggested. So I've just zoomed in on the detail so you can have a better look there. Now notice the finely drawn street lamps. Now, just so we're clear that this isn't a stretch of sand uh, we're looking at, but a promenade. So those street lamps and that, that those two walking figures help with that. And I think the details, these little details, really anchor the viewer. And from those details, we interpret a scale. We understand the full extent of the height uh, from which we're looking down. Um, so that's, it's very helpful in terms of, sort of interpreting the painting, if you like. Now notice the water, the movement of the water, the light of midday and um, shimmering sunlight, then they all help to create that um, hazy, misty atmosphere. Notice the green paint, light green, there's yellow, there's white, there's a kind of mauvey blue. And these paint colors are applied directly onto the canvas in an effort to depict moving water and its various reflections in the sunlight. Now the paint is soft in tone, but nevertheless quite bright. Um, and it appears to be applied directly to the canvas. Um, so that in this way, a leech is moving from those blended soft tones that we saw in his previous landscapes to the use of more unmixed colors. Um, so typical of the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. Now the pale mauve I find very interesting, that, that sort of bluey, purpley light. Um, to me, anyhow, it suggests the kind of shimmering light that rises from water when there is intense heat. Quite similar to my shirt, actually. Um, the boats on the far shore are sketched, as I think you can see, just up the canvas slightly to the left at the top, you can see dashes of white. Um, I think they're boats, perhaps they're lapping waves, but I think they're little boats. And beyond those, you can see um, buildings in the distance. Again, I mean, at the top of the painting, quite very much at the far shore. It's definitely a harbour we can make out with simple working buildings. Now that promenade, back to the promenade in the foreground, see how it's painted in a different way. It's a flatter way. I mean, it is broken up with dashes of paint. Um, almost like an afterthought, perhaps. Again, I just really wanted to emphasize uh, the diversity of techniques in uh, painterly techniques, if you like, in this one picture. So Leach produces that contrast between that flat treatment and the subdued tones of the foreground um, and the broken brushwork and vibrant colors, which was so reminiscent of Impressionism. Uh, and we can see how, how that that brushwork is evident in the in the water and even the harbour and town beyond that. Now back to the composition, just as with uh, the previous painting, in fact the Con Carnot, the composition might suggest that the artist, artist caught the moment in passing and was inspired to paint it out of doors on plein air, as was the, was the fashion for the time. Um, and, and, and in that sense, looking to capture the momentary effect of light on water. Um, but the varied applications of paint and that very careful arrangement of the rising trees in the foreground also suggests that it was very likely to have been carefully planned and considered. 
Now, I couldn't help but wonder, at, after looking at this painting for quite a long time, where exactly the artist might have, position, might have been positioned in, in Monaco, what exactly the view was at the time, and what the view might be now of a very changed Monaco. And I came across this photograph, so humor me, if you will, it's an armchair travel. I don't know when this was taken, but obviously recently, very definitely a 21st century photograph. And it's a photograph of Port Hercule, um, the port of Monaco from the old town in Monaco. So I wondered if perhaps this was roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, uh, the position of Leach, um, and looking down at this and see how, how it's changed in, in the century, intervening century. Now moving on, um, the water Monaco was painted as a, during Leach's frequent visits uh, to France, particularly visiting before the First World War. Um, and that painting, the water Monaco was exhibited in the Royal Hibernian Academy in 1913, the same year it was painted. Now, 1913 was a big year for Leach as well. He painted this wonderful painting, uh, which so many of you will be familiar with, at Covent Garden, Brittany. And it's painted, um, or rather, it's in the collection of the National Gallery of Ireland. Of course, it's um, listed by popular vote as uh, one of Ireland's favourite paintings. Um, now, in this picture, Leach's first wife, so she is the woman uh, with the beautiful face, and beautiful dress, and she's posing as a novice, um, uh, one of the Sœurs de Saint-Esprit, I think that means the Spirit and Sisters, and so we see her looking very uh, contemplative, uh, her prayer book in her hand. We can see the nuns from the same order in the background, in the shadows in the background, with their beautiful skirts and headdresses. Um, and we know that Leach had spent some time in, in this convent, uh, convalescing, recovering from an illness uh, in 1904. So obviously it had left a lasting impression on him because this was painted nine years later. Um, so the setting is the walled garden of the nun's hospital and um, Elizabeth, his wife-to-be, uh, is wearing a Breton bridal costume. Now this was not a reference to their own marriage, this was very typical of novices when they were taking their vows, they would wear a traditional wedding dress. Um, now notice how Leach's practice is developing, how this Firstly, this is a very large painting, it's oil, uh, how kind of vigorous and bold this uh, painting is. The colours that he uses, kind of acid greens, bright yellows, dashes of pink and the multiple luminous shades of, of white that he uses. Uh, you can't see this here, but um, it's painted with a very thick oil paint, heavily impastoed oil paint. So it's got this gleaming sort of lustrous quality when you see it in the flesh. Um, now again, it was no doubt sketched and, and outside, but would have probably been um, planned meticulously and finished carefully in his studio. Now I wanted to show you this because for so many that know of Leach, they know of this painting, but also and it really invites comparison with this painting called Un Matin or A Morning, uh, which was painted five years later. And uh, it's part of the Dublin City Gallery, uh, the Hugh Lane's collection. Again, a very large painting and really interesting to see how his practice is um, progressing. Um, and now, in both paintings, the convent garden and this, we can see how he's interested in landscape, very particularly, we've seen that all along, um, and how his concern in this painting, particularly how his concern for pattern and decorative values um, is really developing. Um, many of Leach's paintings are in fact of flowers and gardens and rural scenes. And he dared in the winters of 1915 and 17, despite it being the First World War, to travel to the fishing village of Les Martigues um, near Marseille and paint 
there quietly, very taken by these uh, beautiful kind of semi-tropical plants, the aloes, um, and the extent to which they grew down there. So this, these aloes inspired a series of aloe paintings, both watercolors and oil paints. And, and in this one, you can see how the form and the shape of the plants really dominate the composition and give the painting an almost abstract feel. Um, now, as a viewer, it's mildly disconcerting. Our position as a viewer, if you like, well, it's not quite settled into the aloes and sitting down and, and looking up, but we're almost, well, we're, we're kneeling down looking at those aloes and really appreciating their exotic beauty. And as you see by this time, Leach was really excelling in 1917, 1918, really excelling as a colorist. Um, the palette here is, of course, multiple shades of uh, blues and greens, really stunning. Little dashes of purple and little splotches of orange as well, some white too. Hugely decorative painting. Um, and as we've seen through all of uh, the paintings, Leach's paintings that we've looked at this morning, we've seen how post-impressionism had a lasting, Im lasting impact on the artist. And in this painting, we can, I think, see the influence of Georges Seurat's luminous colors, of Paul Gauguin's um, exaggerated forms, his rhythmic patterns, his unusual perspectives and also Paul Cezanne, the great Lance, I mean, many things, many great uh, things Paul Cezanne was, but he painted landscapes in the south of France. And uh, I think you can see in the bushes and trees in the background, the very distinctive brushwork that was quite typical of Cezanne's brushwork. Now, interestingly as well, we talked a lot about Japanese and the Asian influence. And if you notice on the left hand corner, take that away, bottom left hand corner in orange, how uh, William Leach has signed his name in the Asian form. And he used this form uh, for a number of years, 1919 to 1920, and really indicates the extent to which he was influenced by uh, that aesthetic. And finally, he painted, uh, or rather, he made the frame of the painting himself. Excuse the quality of the image isn't very good. Now, he may have made the frame uh, because he was short of cash, he was short of time, or more than likely because he wanted to um, add to the decorative effect of the overall image with this really beautiful and very unique frame. Now, to conclude, um, as I said at the beginning, although he spent the greater part of his career abroad, Leach considered himself an Irish painter. He maintained close contact with Ireland, exhibited regularly at the Royal Hibernian Academy. His work was chosen uh, to represent Ireland in Paris in 1922, uh, in Brussels in 1930, he had a, there was a retrospective of his work in Dublin in 1947 and more recently uh, in the National Gallery in Ireland in Dublin um, in 1996. And this retrospective um, went on to Belfast and um, to a location in France. It was a wonderful um, catalogue produced, written by Denise Ferrin. Um, and the title of the catalogue, which is the title of the exhibition, was William John Leach, an Irishman abroad. And that catalogue was the exhibition and the catalogue produced were very important because they really, Leach had led quite a reclusive life, and um, they together really established him as a major force um, and really confirmed his place in, in, in Irish art. Uh, after the First World War, Leach divided his time between London and the south of France, traveling with his companion and later his second wife, May Bottrell. Um, now, although by the end of his life, Leach was continuing to paint broadly the same style, and, and this is an, an impressionist style that at that stage was arguably almost half a century out of date. His paintings have a timeless quality and a sense of atmosphere that appeal to successive generations, including contemporary audiences. 
and Nietzsche's paintings are so enjoyed for their for their sometimes their quiet harmonies and other times their brave and bold use of colour. But I hope you'll agree, even in the paintings that we've seen today, that these works reveal an artist who painted with sincerity and feeling. Um, and sadly, in spite of the high regard his work was held in as an artist, Leach was never commercially successful, but he did succeed nonetheless in creating a number of paintings that are among the most popular paintings with visitors to museums and galleries in Ireland. William John Leach died in 1868 in Guildford in Surrey, where he had settled uh, with his second wife, May Bottrell. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, just to remind you that there are many talks and uh, much, much, in, much of interest, um, so much going on. And you can find out all the information that you need to through the Hugh Lane uh, Gallery website. And that is the address there, as you see. So thanks so much again.